an oral history of the church. I'm Jonathan McCormick. And I'm Adam Crisman. An oral history of the church is a conversational history podcast. This first volume is an oral history of the campus relocation of Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary's main campus from Mill Valley, California to Ontario, California. As of June 2016, the school has a new name, Gateway Seminary of the Southern Baptist Convention. The 13th episode for this volume is an interview with Mark Gentomasso, alumnus of Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary and church planter. I appreciate Mark Gentomasso making the time to, to meet with us. I'm glad that uh, alumni, people who had moved away from the seminary, were still paying attention to the happenings of the seminary and showed interest in our project. Yeah. He, uh, for those uh, who are listening, he saw our announcement in a, a campus newsletter kind of situation and got in touch with us by email, and uh, we were able to bring him into this project to give us yet another uh, helpful perspective on who the seminary was in those last years, you know, who consisted, um, who the seminary consisted of, and um, what this impact looks like from the perspective of of not only any alumnus, but one from one who's not in the last few years, like so many others, um, and at the same time lives on the complete other side of the country, lives on the east coast. Uh, so now he has this 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 distant perspective in a way in a geographic sense, but he still cares very much what goes on with his alma mater, and uh, you'll hear all about that in the upcoming interview. Zooming a bit out from our focus, on that same note, it's nice to see people doing ministry being equipped by this institution that we really care about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's uh let's not dilly dally anymore. Here we are with an interview with Mark Gentomasso. This is Adam Chrisman and Jonathan McCormick interviewing Mark Gentomasso on May sixth, two thousand sixteen. The interview is taking place over the phone. Uh, Mark, I want to appreciate you reaching out to us and uh, giving us your time and your story. Yes, excellent. I appreciate the opportunity to to be a part of the project. Well, we're excited to have you. We have uh, we don't have very many uh, alumni quite yet, just a few. Um, so we're excited to have you on. Our first question is: How did you first hear about Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary? Uh, it's very interesting how I first heard about it. I was uh, a graduate of University of South Florida, a finance marketing major. And at the time, my brother and I started a water ski school on St. Pete Beach in Florida. And while we were doing the water ski school, about a block away, there was a, a church that um, God just impressed on our hearts to, to go visit volunteer to help with the youth ministry and so we did that I was part of that and volunteering and a friend of mine Mark Millman was a U.S. tour missionary in Orlando Mm. and his job was to help I think 10 different church plants to help establish them for two years okay so he he told me about a conference that was happening on St. Pete Beach for church planting And he thought that I would have an interest in it, so he invited me to go. And so I went to the conference, and uh, a man named John Wooster was the one that was presenting. Mm -hmm. And I really connected with what John was saying. And at the time, I began, I had already thought about possibly um, going to seminary and preparing for ministry. Mm-hmm. And so I was looking at the time I was looking at different seminaries and John Wooster had an opportunity to talk with him afterwards. And he said that he was going to be an adjunct professor at Golden Gate. 
Okay. And so he's he's the one that initially got me started and thinking about it, praying about it, and through that conversation and through prayer, um, God led me to you know, to, go to, go, to go to Golden Gate. Um, also because the the church I volunteered at as a youth pastor was a Southern Baptist church, and one of my my goals in going to seminary was to be able to graduate debt free. Uh, so that opened up the doors for, you know, all the Southern Baptist seminaries, mm. but obviously Golden, Golden Gate was the one farthest away from where I lived. And mm. initially I was considering going to Southeastern because it's, you know, the closest one. Right. But then as I looked at, as I looked at the different faculty for each of the schools, the Golden Gate was the only uh, Southern Baptist seminary that had a, a more diverse faculty. Uh, with uh, Dr. Shouse, you know, being from Yale, and uh, another professor that had been a graduate of Harvard, uh, who's, I think, now the pastor of uh, Chiburon Baptist. And his, his name escapes me right now, but he, he was an awesome professor mm -hmm. that I uh, learned a lot from. Okay. What 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 what's his name again? Do you know, do you know who I'm referring to? Uh, I, our our pastors have changed at Tiburon Baptist Church a couple times in recent years. Um, Dr. Shouts actually became our pastor at Tiburon Baptist Church for um, okay. quite a few years, from I think about 2010 until last fall. So for about five years, I believe. Um, gotcha. Glenn Prescott has been uh, an associate pastor at Tiburon for a number of years. Does that name ring a bell? No, I think the professor I was thinking, of, I think he might be a New Testament professor, maybe Greek. He taught an awesome class. It was called The Art of Being a Student, <laughs> uh, which, which was a great, great class. His name will come to me in just a minute. Uh, um, but, yeah. yeah. Dr. Ken Eakins was a um, adjunct, I mean, a, an interim pastor at Tiburon for a number of years. Okay. Um, uh, and he was Old Testament professor. Um, and I'm thinking Old Testament professor around the time you were there. Um, right. Yeah, I'm sorry. The names right. are escaping me of the previous pastors here. That's not a problem. Not a problem. <laughs> well, if it comes back to you during the interview, feel free to yeah. to let us know, um, or afterwards, sure. and we can mention it in our uh, conclusion. So, how did you come to first? Okay. Uh, how did you first come to study here? Then, um, how did that work out? So, you noticed the the diversity of the of the faculty, and it was an SPC, a seminary, which worked with your budget and with your theological interests, um, how, how did that work out to get you from point A to point B? Right. Well, I had been to California one other time in my life, and it was a great experience. I was in San Francisco just for like two or three days, and so I was a little familiar with the area, uh, not, not much. Uh, so I set up a time to visit out there. I wanted to visit before I made a commitment and talk to some, some people there. Um, right. As it turned out, when I came for a visit for two or three days, whoever I was scheduled to meet with was not available. And But there were some other people there that I could talk to. Um, and I'm not sure if Mike Thompson was one of those people, but he, he was a great guy that um, okay. made a big impact, I know, in a lot of guys' lives. Um, uh, and when I came there, God just really, uh, impressed upon my heart that without a doubt, that's where he wanted me to go. Mm. Uh, that's awesome. So then we, yeah. Yeah. So then we, we went back home and my brother and I sold the water ski school that we had and used that money to buy a vehicle to get out there. And then also paid for the first, uh, couple of years of school there. Wow, that's great. Cool. And how long? Uh, how long did you study? Uh, how long were you at Golden Gate? I uh, was there for three years. 
Yeah, and what what years were those? I'm thinking it was ninety to ninety three. Okay. Yeah. So Doctor Eakin. Oh, Luke I know. Was, uh, go ahead. The professor just came to my mind. I had mentioned earlier a uh, Barry Stricker. Oh right, right, yes. I uh, keep hearing his name. <laughs> I don't know how that slips. Is he still him. there? <laughs> he still no, the he's, he's not around it, uh, here anymore. He's now involved okay. in a church plant um, um, in the Midwest. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Our uh, our current pastor at Tiburon Baptist Church was installed just this spring. Um, Bryce Butler, who will soon be Dr. Bryce Butler, um, who was a student here in the late 90s. Uh, okay. Yeah, like 98, 99, 2000, I think. Um, so um, your connection with Golden Gate Seminary is uh, alumnus, is that correct? Yes. Have you ever done any adjunct teaching for the seminary or um, maybe worked for the school while you were here, anything like that? No, I didn't. What, one of my favorite questions to ask when we do these interviews is, what are some of your favorite memories of studying at Golden Gate in this location? Uh, there's probably a lot of memories, but for me, I, I for some reason, I consider that time in that area uh, kind of like my time in the wilderness. <laughs> yeah, because it it, it it was very beautiful wilderness to be in. Yeah, but uh, I I love the outdoors, and so being in that area, it was. I, I hate to use the word magical, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but uh, it it really for me was a uh, very uh, spiritually significant time period mm-hmm. in my life. Uh, I think just moving there, being so far away from family, friends, not really knowing anyone initially when I got there mm. was kind of a good experience for me because it was really just my time alone with God. And for probably the first year I was there, almost every weekend I would visit a different church because oh, yeah. uh, I knew I wanted to go into church planting and so I wanted a, a broad view of different churches. Mm. Uh, so that was a great experience. It's uh, I'd hit the road on the weekends and go up to Mount Shasta, go to the you know, the wine country, go to mm-hmm. all different places, visit, visit different churches, um, tons of hikes. And so probably a, a memorable experience was just spending time outside, um, going to Muir Woods. I don't know if you ever been to Muir Woods. Oh yeah. Um, and, and, done the hike from the, you know, Muir Woods up over the mountain to the Pacific. Yeah. Just did that number of times and, you know, countless quiet times out there on the beach uh, or in the Redwood Forest and, um, or in the city. You know, I love going to, into the city. Um, I loved uh, a, a closet that was in the men's dorm on the second floor where I lived and there's an empty closet, and I just go in there and have quiet times. Mm. Um, and probably a, a greatest memory was just the the number of uh, men that I had the opportunity to develop friendships with, mm-hmm. you know, that I still keep in contact with, that, I mean, probably every week, if not every day, I think about, pray for, you know, these different guys. And, yeah. Um. Uh, so for me, it was a, a time of, you know, many, many memories. I was a uh, uh, baseball coach at uh, Tam High. Oh, wow. Cool. And then my best friend, um, Evan Lauer, who's a, a pastor in Orange County right now, he was the volleyball coach mm-hmm. um, on the girls' volleyball team. And so we just ministered at Tam High and probably one of the most memorable of memories was uh, my best friend Evan was also a surfer, mm-hmm. so he, he started the uh, probably the first and last ever seminary surf club. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so there were you know, half a dozen guys. We get up in the in the dark and go out surfing, and 
through our connections at Tam High, uh, through the baseball team, and uh, we organized a uh, a surf trip to Baja, Mexico. And these students, these you know, they're high school kids. Their parents, you know, were the ones, you know, the flower child children from the '60s. Those were their parents, right? And you know, we invited them to go on this trip, and I'm not. I have no recollection that we ever talked to any parent that said, yeah, you know, you know, my child can go with you. You know, there's no permission slip signed. We just say, hey, do you want to go? And they said, okay. <laughs> so we go down to Baja, Mexico for a week, sleep on the beach in tents, and, you know, talk about, you know, God and life. And one of the guys on the trip became a believer. And, oh. um, you know, it's just one of those, memories that we'll never forget, but those high school kids will never forget either. Yeah. Uh, even though they're not in contact with them. Uh, right. been, a, lot, a lot of great memories. And I, another one was just going downtown or to Mill Valley to the depot there to the cafe. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that was in a time where, like, back in Florida, there were no cafes. There were no Starbucks. There was no you know, places like that to hang out. But yeah. in Mill Valley, there was. So I go down to the depot and you could randomly sit next to anyone and talk about spiritual matters. Yeah. And it's probably still the same. You know, they've got a spiritual story and you know, but they were all talking about matters. Uh, you know, they, you know, they were wide open to, to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, an opportunity I had was uh, I did a lot of odd jobs in the community, working for people in the community, which I really loved because I got to really know the community and the, the people in it. Mm-hmm. And one of the jobs I had was for, for uh, working for a guy named Leon Felton. And at the time, Leon was in his uh, early 80s. I think he had just turned 80. But he was one of the, he lived on a in a house on Sausal- in Sausalito on the hill there, overlooking the bay. Yeah. And at the time, he was uh, building a ship uh, up in Chicken Hey there, we lost you. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, now we're back. I, I don't know where we got cut off, but I was probably telling a story about a guy named Leon Felton. Yeah, you were. Uh, we we lost you when you said he was building a ship for something. Oh yeah, he was building a ship. And he had a crew of twenty guys building this ship for that he was going to travel around the world on. And he he was one of the first people in America, uh, or in that area, anyways, to import foreign cars. Okay. Hmm. And, and all of his friends said nobody in America will buy a foreign car. And he said, well, I think they will. So he imported. Porsche, BMW, and Audi cars, and of course became a multi-millionaire. Yeah, and so he built this ship that cost two million to build it. And when it came into the you know, harbor at Sausalito, I was the one that got to go on the boat, and get it fixed up, and get it ready for his voyage across the world. <laughs> and when he was leaving, he I had just gotten married, and he said, "Well, I'm going on this trip around the world. I don't know when I'll be back, but..." Um, do you want to stay at my house and take care of it? You know, just kind of be a just watch over my house. Well, here's a you know multi million dollar house on Sausalito, <laughs> yeah. over yeah. the bay. I just just got married. You know, it was it was unbelievable. <laughs> wow. And so I stayed there, and that only lasted probably six months. And he came back and he said, "It's not what I thought it was. So I'm not going to do that now." <laughs> I'm not, um, and I'm not lying. He donated this ship, two million dollar ship, to the boys' club. Wow! <laughs> and that was Leon, and so I had met. He was kind of like a grandfather to me because I never really had a grandfather. Mm. And I think I was kind of like a grandson to him. And we had many, many uh, biblical talks. And he was really a spiritual seeker. Mm-hmm. And it's so much so that the name of his ship was called Seeker. Mm-hmm. And so we had many conversations. I can remember that uh, I, I got him a Bible 
one time, and I put on the, the, the cover of the Bible. I had printed Captain Leon Felton. <laughs> so I gave this Bible to him. He never read the Bible. And I said, Leon, you know, you, you've researched and all these different, you know, religions. And I mean, he did. He had bookcases full of different religions in there, mm-hmm. you know, that he had read about. Yeah. And I said, have you ever read the Bible? He said, well, no. He said no, I've never read the Bible. I said, you, you know, you've got to read the Bible. And so I gave him the Bible, and then a week later, I asked him if he had a chance to, you know, to read the Bible. And he said, oh, yeah, I read that book. And he said, that was really a good book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, well, maybe you read a couple of chapters. He, he read the whole book. It wow. must have been a week. <laughs> and so he's eight years old. I invited him to church, and this is uh, at Bay Marin. Um uh, mm-hmm there and so I can remember he called me up Saturday night and he said hey uh, Mark um, you know I'm still going to come to church with you tomorrow but um, he said is there anything I need to know like are they going to make me do something or is is it going to be really awkward or if I can get embarrassed and I said oh no no, that's not going to happen he said because I've really only been to church like twice in my life and I think one was for a wedding one was for a funeral Mm mm-hmm and like those are the types of people that made going to school at Golden Gate interesting for me. Yeah. You know, people that were about as unchurched as you could get. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, I, you know, as you know, like the, the New Age Bible was written in Tiburon. And so just that, those types of people that you'd have conversations with. Uh, I can remember for Dr. Stricker doing a project, I forget what class it was, but part of my project, I decided I wanted to do some on-the-street interviews with people. And so I went to Berkeley and just did on-the-street interviews, questions like, you know, who do you think God is and who is God to you? And, yeah. what, you know, what just, just random questions like that. And just talking to those people is very enlightening you know, as to where they're coming from. Um, so those are a few memories, probably more than you wanted to hear. But yeah, no, that's fine. Everything is, all the all the stories are good because we're trying to get what I've been referring to as a lateral perspective on uh, what the seminary was like in this time. So uh, don't worry about that. In fact, we want to make sure that we're getting yeah things that wouldn't have otherwise been recorded. Yeah. So this is exactly okay. what we want to hear. Yeah. To that right. end, um, we know that the time in seminary is something that you, you're working hard at to accomplish some goals. What was your most prized achievement that you earned while at this campus? Uh, and we have phrased that intentionally broadly so that we can get whatever you most valued as what you accomplished, whether it's an actual physical award or something you did in your degree program or a ministry achievement. Yeah. Something that you achieved while you were here. Oh, that's a great question. I'll tell you the first thing that came to my mind was when we were part of the uh, Bay Marin church plant. I think initially it was called uh, Mount Tam Community Church, and then while I was there, it kind of transitioned into uh, Bay Marin mm-hmm. with John with John Wooster. Well, we met at the Catholic University or College that's in town. I I, I forget the name of it now. Mm-hmm. It's Dominican. Uh, it's a university nowadays. It's Dominican University of California. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yep, Dominican, and we would set up you know, drive the trucks there and do set up and set up the classrooms and you know, haul mm-hmm. all the stuff in, do all that. And uh, I can remember setting up in one of the classes and there's a student in the class and I said, you know, so I was telling her what we were doing and she uh, said, uh, well, I'm from China, from Northern China. So I just started asking questions and invited her to come to church and I said, hey, have you ever read the Bible? And she said, no, I've never read the Bible, but I've always wanted to. Mm-hmm. And she was from communist China, and, you know, they would have been 
put in jail or killed, they would have been found with the Bible. Right. So, so because of that, she her whole life had an interest in reading the Bible. Yeah. And so uh, at the time, my uh, wife and I were, were married and we were living in, you know, that mansion in Sausalito. <laughs> and so I had a, like a six-week study on the Bible. And I said, hey, well, um, would you be interested in just reading the Bible together? And she said, yeah, definitely. And so we went through this six-week study on, on salvation and sin and looking up scriptures. And she invited one of her other friends that was an international student, I think also from China. Okay, yeah. And I can still remember the last meeting we had together. They said, well, we'll come over to your place and we'll cook traditional Chinese uh, meals. And I said, great. So uh, we get to the last session, like a six-week session thing, Bible study. And, you know, the last question is, would, would you like to become a Christian? And when I asked that question, she looked at us like like that was the, the dumbest question I she'd ever heard. <laughs> and she said, would I like to become a Christian? She said, of, she said, of course I'd like to become a Christian. I've already, be, I've already become a Christian. <laughs> And so for me, you know, like that, that was the highlight of being able to just invest and share the gospel with international students. Um, and it, there are numerous stories like that that God used with international students that we had a chance to share the gospel with. And uh, it's uh, for me, that area was very unique. And, I mean, there's not another place like it in the world. Mm. Then San Francisco, and as you may know, in, in the city, there's a, um, a high school called the High School of Nations, mm-hmm. and they they teach in 12 different languages. Wow. And so there are more people from around the world that are flowing through San Francisco than any other place in the world. Yeah. The nations that, only have come to us. Right. Right, exactly. So, yeah, you don't have to be a missionary and go anywhere. Just go downtown San Francisco or Mill Valley and, you know, share the gospel, and those people are going to go back to their land, and yeah, they, they become the missionaries. Um, so that, that, that's one aspect that made it really unique for me, and, and one of the reasons I just, guys led me to go and gay was I think a comment was that my friend Mark Millman had made and uh, when he was talking about church planting, and he said that the thing that he had learned and worked with so many different church planters was one of the best things that you can do as a future church planter is to learn as much as you can about as many different types of people as you can. Mm-hmm. And as soon as he said that sentence, immediately I knew that God was calling me to Golden Gate because I yeah. knew that that was, that was the place where I would have the most exposure to the most different types of people um, all across the world. Uh, I think also my background is very entrepreneurial, and I didn't mm-hmm. expect that when I went out to California, is that there are a lot of entrepreneurial people out there. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. And it might come from, you know, those were the risk takers that left, you know, the security of the East Coast and, traveled in wagons, and I think some of that same aura continues out in the West. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I really enjoyed that. Uh, I worked for um, the uh, the club that's right down the hill from the seminary. I was a security officer there. And oh, so I, I got to develop, you know, friendships with people there and share the gospel with numerous people and give Bibles away and um, and then from there, God led me to start a business. And so I, I had run out of money my last year. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I went down to the, the pizza place down at the bottom of the hill, and they were going to give me a job for, I think, $8 an hour. And when they said that, I thought, wow, I think I could go door to door in this neighborhood and get more money than that, just <laughs> volunteering for jobs. Yeah. And so that's what God led me to do. I just went to the first house at the, you know, right near the seminary. And I said, uh, do you have windows that you need cleaned? Um, and then she said, yes, I do. And I, she said, well, how much does it cost? I said, well, I'm just volunteering or I'm, I'm just doing this for a donation because I'm trying to pay my way through school. 
And so you, you can just pay me whatever you'd like to pay me. And so I just, that's what I did for the next year. And the first lady said, well, at the end, she said, well, how much do I owe you? I said, whatever you want to donate. She said, well, it's $20 an hour, okay? I said, that will be, that'll be great. Mm-hmm. And wow. so that, that's how God provided for my last year in seminary. Yeah. Just doing that sort of thing. And through that, I got to meet the community, be in their homes, you know, cleaning their homes and fixing things and painting rooms and cleaning windows. And uh, One of the guys that had the opportunity to clean their house was the guy that invented one of the first treadmills. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and took me out in his boat out in the bay and sent me a wedding gift when I got married. And <laughs> nice. So I think that's probably what I enjoyed most is just being in, a, in an environment of non-Christians and having an opportunity to share the truth. Yeah. Um, so. All right. Uh, so, so achievements, that, that would probably be for me my greatest of memory and being able to, and it's obviously it wasn't anything I achieved. It was just what yeah. God achieved and worked through me, and yeah. uh, which was you know a huge blessing, and to be able to you know start to share the truth of the gospel and people's lives change, not just their lives, but you know for generations and generations after them as they pass the faith to the next generation. Yeah. You've begun to answer the, our next question, but we want to we'll ask it anyway. specifically. <laughs> um, before the announced sale, and you know, specifically when you were here as a student, what was your impression of the relationship between Golden Gate's Mill Valley campus and the students here and our neighbors? Uh, the neighbors there in the community? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I can only speak from my own personal experience. And, you know, whenever I needed work, I'd go to the job board, and there would always be jobs. Mm. And uh, I think, you know, that the different people I worked for in the community, they really respected the students um, at Golden Gate. Mm-hmm. You know, they knew that they were trustworthy. They had long relationships with students. Uh, I think the many students that you know worked in the, the homes of the people in the community there made an impact that we'll never know about. Yeah. Uh, you know, many seeds that were planted, and uh, so you know, I wish, or not, not that I wish, but I, I don't know how the relationship could have been better. And I'm sure there were people in the community that that didn't want Golden Gate to be there. Uh, just because scripture says there is no fellowship with darkness and light. Yeah. Uh, but for me personally, I, I was very grateful for the opportunity to yeah. you know, be in the home for the, the, the neighbors and the community. Like right now, I'm thinking of numerous houses and people yeah. and friendships and relationships and, yeah. you know, of people in that community just right around the school within a few blocks. That's awesome. Were you able to maintain any of these uh, friendships and relationships uh, after you you moved away from the seminary? Oh, I, I tried to with Leon Felton. Mm-hmm. You know, I tried to continue to write him, to um, you know, encourage him, you know, in the faith. And, uh, but it, I, I probably only heard back from him maybe twice. And then I just lost touch, and, I, and then I heard that he had passed away, which I figured he would be, you know, he was in his early 80s when I knew him. Yeah. Uh, but that, that was the only one. And then my life got busy, I get married, having children, and and I lived in, at that time, I lived in Florida. I had moved back to Florida. Yeah. How did your perception of the relationship between the seminary and its neighbors change, uh, if at all, after the our current president, Dr. Jeff Orge, announced the sale of this property. Uh, what, could you repeat the question? I'm not sure I understood exactly what the question was. 
how did your perception of the relationship between the seminary and its neighbors change after Dr. Orge announced that uh, he sold the property? If it changed at all. If that changed at all. Yeah. I don't know if my perception changed. That's just from what I read. It, it seemed as though the, the seminary was having a challenging time trying to, to do anything, you mm -hmm. know, to make changes building wise or um, that way. Um, so for me, my, my perception probably hasn't changed just because I don't know the people. And, uh, but I, sure. what I do. You're out in Virginia now, is that right? Yeah, I'm in, I'm in Virginia, and I think the thought that comes to my mind is obviously I don't know any of the details of the sale or really all the details of why it was sold. But because of the the relationships of the people that I knew there that worked there at the seminary, mm -hmm. like I completely I completely trust that they're seeking the Lord and uh, that. You know, this is a decision that God's led them to do. Um, in my own world, I wish the seminary was still going. Yeah. And, and would stay there. Um, there'll never be another place like that. And But there, there's ministry everywhere. You know, there's ministry in Canada. I mean, anywhere we go on the planet, there are people that need to be ministered to. Right. Um uh, but that that place is very unique, and I, I and I don't know. I think there's a lot of other students that feel the way I do about it. Mm -hmm. You know, like that that was a very uh, life transforming period in their lives. Yeah. And I, I like that's why I was really trying to get like a reunion together because I, I think I could, you know, I I just called a half a dozen friends and I said, hey, I mean, these are people all across the United States now. Yeah. And I said, hey, what about us meeting back up at the gate? And yeah, for like a final reunion, they're like, I'm in, tell me when, <laughs> when it is. And I kept trying to organize something through the school and, and it just, it just nothing was, uh, was happening. Yeah. Uh, before that. Uh, yeah. But, you know, it, that's all in God's hands. But, yeah. Uh, and I, I hope that it's not just money that, you know, we got a lot of money and we can relocate, you know, because my, my dad was part of a, a school, a Bible school in Florida. Florida it's actually called Florida Bible School. Okay. And it was located on on the beach, on the Atlantic, and it was in an old um, hotel. And, I mean, it was, you know, one of a kind place. And they, they sold it because they got a bunch of money and they could build a place in the middle of Florida. But it's never the same again. Yeah, you know, money, money does more. Money doesn't mean more ministry. Yeah. Um, so, but I'm sure that there are a lot of other reasons besides money that you know it's relocating. Yeah. So our next questions are about uh, the interviewees' perceptions, per opinions about the sale, and you've already actually basically answered those. So your opinion about the sale when you first found out was uh, sadness that they were leaving, uh, but um, did you did you have that acceptance of well there's there's the work is is going to be done no matter where they are was that something you also felt at that time or has it uh, come to that uh, uh, here now in May of 2016? Uh, at first, yeah, I was definitely sad at first. And when I first heard it, mm -hmm. I mean, my first thought was, you know, that I really wanted to, to get back out there before, it, you know, it, it got bulldozed. And uh, just because it meant so much to me, you know, being there. Yeah. Uh, and I think that uh, wherever it goes, it will attract a different student. Um, and I could, I could be wrong, but I know the reason I went, one of the main reasons I went there is because of the location. Yeah. yeah. And just the, and the opportunity to be immersed in, in, in really in the middle of the world. Right. It's hard in, to, one, in one location. Yeah. It's really hard to, I think, to enumerate 
exactly what it's like in this location to be so close to communities of such an intense variety of people groups and languages and cultures all within, say, a 30-minute drive. Right. You know? Yep. Yeah. What do you hope the seminary will prioritize as they make this transition? This is our last question, by the way. Um, the first thing that came to my mind is, and I don't really know if this answers the question, but I would have hoped that they would have reached out more to the alumni, and maybe they have, and I'm just out of the loop of things. Um, and uh, just future support comes from alumni often. But if they don't feel part, if they don't feel part of the process, or feel that their input is uh, valued, then you know the, the resources don't flow either from yeah. that. To me, it, it seemed wise to, to to reach out to you know the, the alumni and do some type of you know big celebration of what God's doing um, and, and invite all the alumni back. Like yeah. all of them, and I mean, I, I think there would be thousands of former students and alumni that would come. Yeah, and we've seen quite and, a few on the campus here. Just by the way, uh, those what's come, that? We have seen quite a few come through the campus, kind of informally. Um, Jonathan and I both live and work on the campus as we study in our our programs and. Um, a lot of folks have been coming by just kind of on their own, yeah. you know, a, a single person here, a married couple there, uh, that sort of a thing. Uh, so it's been interesting to see, and so, some folks are getting to have that experience. Um, but right. it, it's it's not as formalized as um, as you're describing. Right. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to stifle your answer. If you had anything else you wanted to add, um, do you have anything more you wanted to say about what you hope the seminary will prioritize um, as they hand the keys over this summer? Um, no, I don't, you know, I don't know all the details of you know where all the professors are going to go and, and all of that. Uh, but you know, there, there are some professors that have really invested a good part of their life there. You know, Dr. Gaines, Leroy Gaines. Yeah, you know, I still, still remember when I invited him over to my dorms for lunch, and you know, he came, and um, there's a number, uh, there's a number of professors I know that have been there a long time, and I, and I really hope the seminary will take care of them and um, you know, just honor them for you know what for giving a good part of their life, you know, to building the, the seminary there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we appreciate you taking your time out of your schedule to meet with us, and uh, thank you for calling us on the phone. It's uh, it's good to get a perspective more than just the people that Adam and I have direct contact with. So we, we really value your perspective in this. Yeah, definitely. Oh, uh, great. Well, I appreciate the work you guys are doing and kind of helping to preserve the history and how many years will the seminary have been there? I don't even know. Fifty-seven. Fifty-seven. Yeah. All right. Excellent. That was Mark Chan Tomasa, church planter and alumnus of the Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary. I really enjoyed hearing from Mark about all of the work, all the ministry work that he did. I mean, it was it was really good to hear. All of what he was talking about, really, with, with he's done so much ministry over the years. He did so much in the years leading up to his time at Golden Gate, but then while he was at the seminary, that he worked so hard while he was here, that his focus was not only the books, not only the papers, but also the doing of ministry, uh, reaching out to the local community, all different kinds of folks. And we see with him, uh, as well as others in this 
study that we've done, uh, that there were successful or relatively successful inroads with the 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 natives of Marin County, the 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 wealthy, those who lived in Sausalito. He talked about especially that that man in Sausalito. Um, mm-hmm. But we we see that there have been some successes, uh, even if he's he's not a hundred percent sure about that man's uh, salvation story, if he has one or not. Um, still, he he found a way to get in and and to matter to somebody and to share the gospel with them. So it, even though the seminary had a difficult time in land development, individual seminarians found ways to communicate the gospel in that county anyway. I agree. It's good to hear that the ministries that we are a part of during the time we're studying can continue on and grow beyond our time here, both by people who pick up and come behind us and by a continued connection with the relationships that we've we've established. I think uh, Mark did a, a wonderful job ministering here, and I'm thankful for the work God had in his life. Yeah. Yeah. Well... If you're listening, Mark, thank you again for the time that you made for talking to us and uh, sharing a a wonderful addition to this study on uh, Golden Gate Seminary's campus relocation and its history. But let's talk about the next episode as well. Our next one is with Dr. Bryce Butler. He is a two-time alumnus of Golden Gate Seminary and the current senior pastor of Tiburon Baptist Church, which, if you are unaware, is a church local to the Mill Valley campus that was recently sold by the seminary. In August, we are releasing two episodes, this episode, which you're listening to now, and Dr. Bryce Butler, two weeks from now on August 26. Thank you for listening to us. We appreciate your faithfulness. Don't forget the YouTube versions of these episodes include photographs of Marin County and the seminary in 2016. I think these photographs help give a bit of context and understanding of the environment that we're really talking about in these interviews. So come over and give it a listen. Episode 14 with Dr. Bryce Butler will be available two weeks from today on August 26th. If this podcast has been enjoyable to you and a productive use of your time, uh, please subscribe. We don't want you to miss any episodes. Uh, Rate us and review. That way other people can hear about our project and receive the same benefits that you've received. That's right. Well, may God bless you as you go. He's already gone before.